we could have our seats, let me introduce to you Dr. Ellen Davis of the Duke University Divinity School. Um, a lot of you were here yesterday, so I don't need to do a long introduction, but she, she is a graduate of University of California, Berkeley, uh, Yale University, uh, the Divinity School, and a PhD from Yale University. She has taught at Union Theological Seminary, Yale, and now at uh, Duke. And a Virginia Episcopal, yes, for the Episcopalians in our midst, we got, we got to mention that, Virginia Episcopal Seminary, I've got to remember that. Um, she is a lifelong cradle um, Episcopalian, and so we're really great, great to have uh, Episcopalians in our midst. The theology is similar, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, we don't need to get into it, but it's similar. I mean, there's enough... Yes, emphasis. Yes, good. One of the remarkable things about her work is how she has taken her, her, her primary uh, area is Old Testament. What she has done with it is taken it into the land and the emphasis on the land uh, in ways that are really unique in uh, uh, modern Old Testament scholarship. So uh, we are most grateful to have her here, especially in this time and place in our history at New York Avenue Church. Uh, two blocks from the White House and all those other kinds of things that we could mention about who we are and what we're called to be and do. She is um, a, a, um, a timely presence for us. So, Ellen Davis, thank you for being with us again. Thank you so much. Um, I was um, asked to speak about why ecology is important to me as a biblical scholar, so that's my topic. And I've, what I've prepared is a relatively short uh, lecture so that that gives us time for back and forth. But if it turns out that you want to hear more, lec more lecture, I can do more of that. But let's start with something relatively brief and then see um, what that leads to for us. So the simple answer to the question of why I, as a biblical scholar, would have taken an interest in ecology some, I don't know, 20, almost 30 years ago now, why I would have written a book 10 years ago called Scripture, Culture, and Agriculture. Um, the answer to why that makes sense is that nearly every page of the certainly of the Hebrew Bible, it's more pronounced in Old Testament than in New Testament, Virtually every page, every chapter, makes some reference to living systems, to land, water, earth and sky, seed and plant, animal life, wild and domesticated. And the reason that every chapter of the Old Testament makes mention of such things is that Israelites were farmers way over 90% of the population were farmers. And farmers, as you know, if, they're go if they succeed as farmers, they're ecologists. They are students of living systems. Uh, especially this is the case if one farms an area as challenging and marginal for agriculture as the uplands of Canaan the hill country of Judea and Samaria, which is characterized by thin soil, steep, um, steep slopes. It's kind of a corduroy landscape. Um, frequent drought, as I mentioned yesterday, if you were here four years out of 10 years on average in the Levant are drought years. Um, and wind erosion. So it's sometimes said that farmers are contending with the, t uh, the two, it, with the constant threat of desertification becoming desert through drought and through erosion. Uh, just to put a few pictures in your head, these are pictures of the Judean hills planted as they would have been planted by farmers in the Iron Age in biblical times, um, and probably up uh, pretty much as they would have been planted any time up until the modern period in that area. You can see 
the soil is it's called terra, terra rosa, terra rosa, red soil. It is thin, rich soil on a um, laid on a limestone skeleton, and you see the limestone outcroppings here. You can only farm by way of terraces in this um, hill country. And the terraces, it's sometimes impossible to tell whether the terraces are natural terraces, just the limestone outcropping, or whether it's been built up. Most of them are probably a combination of the two. Um, so here's one picture. And maybe we're not going anywhere with this. Okay. Uh, another one that shows the terracing on the slope more clearly. But I'm determined to see if I can at least get this. It's not going anywhere. Okay. And then this is a picture that was done near the turn of the 20th century, 19th, 20th century. Um, it's a vineyard, again, one of the traditional crops of the hill country. But... Um, and this is on somewhat flatter ground. Um, so the reason I want to show you these pictures is to suggest that the Bible as we have it, with these constant references to the land, to, to what maintains life on the land, the Bible as we have it, could not have been, been written in North America. Um, it, Wes Jackson, a um, farmer I'll be talking about, uh, and a uh, plant geneticist, winner of the MacArthur um, Genius Awards for his work in agriculture. Um, Wes Jackson once said to me, this goes back probably 25 years, but it became a generating question for me, why does the Bible always get it right about land? Um, I didn't know enough about farming to know that the Bible always got it right about land, but that sort of gave me a way to focus my attention. And I would say that the reason the Bible got it right about land is because there was no land to be wasted in the hill country of Israel, the area that Israel controlled through most of the biblical period. And the reason the Bible could not have been written in North America is that for centuries, we, for centuries of European occupation here, we had too much land to waste. Um, but that's over now. And we are living in a world more like that of the biblical writers. Uh, there isn't any more margin for waste and error, not only on this continent, but all around the world, where more than 40% of arable land is, um, is severely compromised, degraded. Well, it's, it is, more than 40% is degraded in various degrees of severity. So in this short presentation, I'm going to say a few things about how the biblical writers think about land and human life in relation to land, um, things that I am convinced are useful to us now around the globe. And I'm going to identify three principles, points of connection between biblical ways of thinking and the best contemporary thinking about land and ecology. Um, and so if you'd show the next slide, and exemplars of the best contemporary thinking about land and ecology are these three, I'll call them neo-agrarian writers um, and farmers. Um, work who've been publishing work that's had an enormous impact in this country over the last 40 years. So best known of them being Wendell Berry. Let's see if this works. This does work. Okay, so Wendell Berry. Um, West Jackson. Uh, Wendell um, farms uh, a hillside farm in, um, uh, in Kentucky, about an hour outside Louisville. Um, 
Wes Jackson farms in Salina, Kansas, and he is the founder of the Land Institute. And for about 35 years now, Wes has been working on, I like this, he says, I don't work on I don't work on problems in agriculture, I work on the problem of agriculture. Um, because he says the way we have practiced agriculture for 10 to 12,000 years is inherently destructive depending upon annual planting and increasingly, certainly in the modern period, annual planting in monoculture. Um, inherently destructive. So the model he has developed, um, he says, it uses nature as mentor, model, and measure, and he's developing a um, perennial grains to uh, that um, fit into the ecosystem of the high grass prairie of Kansas where he farms. It's remarkable work being done at the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas. And then my colleague, Norman Wurzba at Duke Divinity School, uh, a very fine theologian and, um, and agrarian writer. So, th uh, three basic um, agrarian principles. And the first of them, I, if I could, okay. Um, the life of the land is inseparable from human life. The health of the land is inseparable from the health of the human communities and the non-human communities, or the communities of human and non-human creatures that live on the land in each particular place. Um, so the, even using the phrase, the life of the land, um, to think of the land as having a life is somewhat countercultural in, um, in our own time and place, when we tend to think of land as an it, um, as an object to be worked upon, and as something purely external to ourselves, which we manipulate skillfully to suit our ends. That's, that may seem to us like the obvious way to view land, so it's important to recognize it is completely contrary to the way the Bible views land. Um, the land in the Bible is more like a relative. Uh, it's more like kinfolk, uh, an immediate relation, and remember ancient Israel is a kinship-based society. So I'm uh, thinking of Genesis 2, verse 7. Um, the, um, uh, the Lord God formed the human being, Adam. I don't know that I put, made a slide for this. May I see? Oh, I did. Okay. Uh, the Lord God formed um, the human being. That's how I'm translating the Hebrew word Adam. Um, as dust from Adama. Uh, Adama is fertile soil. Uh, Adama is not just ground, it's, um, it's ground from which you can bring forth living things, plants. So, uh, the Lord God formed Adam as dust from Adama. This is, as I've given you here, this is one of the very rare instances in which a biblical pun actually works in English. So the Lord God formed the human from humus. Um, and of course that Latin-based pun is also a deliberate one, as is the Hebrew one. Um, something that I have never found a way to translate into English is that Adam and Adama both come from the same root, and the word Adom is about the color of your seats. Okay, it's a reddish brown color. Okay, so Adom is the skin tone, you might say, of both the soil and humans in the Levant. 
Okay, I told you that the soil is, is called terra rasa, terra rosa. It's a reddish brown soil. Um, so this pun is evoking that they are, they're kin. They come, one comes from the other. So the land is kinfolk. It is also a covenant partner. Uh, and the quote that I've given he you here from the book of Leviticus one of your favorite books of the Bible. Um, Leviticus actually is one of my favorite books of the Bible. It's an exceedingly green book. Leviticus is very, very interested in the question of how um, people live on the land and how they raise their animals and grow their crops as virtually every Israelite did. So this verse that I've given you comes from um, almost the end of Leviticus. And at this point, Leviticus is set in the wilderness, but the book was probably actually um, composed or assumed its final form during the Babylonian exile. Um, and in this, um, in this, God is looking because the ostensible setting of Leviticus is wilderness before Israel gets into the promised land. God is looking to the far side of Israel dwelling in the land, looking toward their exile from the land to Babylon, where the people will languish, where they will be landless. And God imagines what God's own response to the people will be in the future when they are in exile. And this is what God says. I will remember my, J my Jacob covenant, and yes, my Isaac covenant, and yes, my Abraham covenant, and yes, my Ab uh, and sorry, and yes, my Abraham covenant. I will remember, and the land, I will remember. What's weird about this, just in terms of biblical idiom? What's weird about Jacob covenant, Isaac covenant, Abraham covenant? Reverse order. Reverse order. It's backwards. It's usually Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Okay. It's backwards, so we are moving from most recent to most ancient, and so the implication is that before Abraham, the land was, that the land is the even more ancient ancestor, exactly as Genesis suggests. And the book of Leviticus looks, is a very creation-oriented book. Um, so if you'll look at the next slide, a, this is covenant language, obviously, my Jacob covenant, my Isaac covenant, Abraham covenant, and the land I will remember. It's the way covenant is conceived in the Bible, as Leviticus indicates, but it's, it's broadly conceived this way, is not a bilateral arrangement between humans and God or Israel and God, but it's better conceived as a, triangul a healthily triangulated relationship amongst God, human beings, or Israel, and the created order or specifically the land of Israel. Um, okay, so a second principle uh, follows from this notion, um, and that is the, from the notion of the land as covenant partner, and that is that the land is literally invaluable. You cannot put a price to it. There's a curious thing that we have, as you know, we have lots of legal records from the ancient world, um, from archaeology. Uh, there is no record either within the Bible or in the archaeological, the extra-biblical record. Um, there is no record of Israelites voluntarily selling arable land on the open market. No record of Israelites voluntarily selling arable land on the open market, which is to say there is no indication of an Israelite real estate 
market. Okay, again, something whose existence we take for granted in our culture. Um, according to Leviticus, only property in cities could be sold outright. Okay, you could, if you owned a townhouse, a condo, a landless piece of you know, a house, um, but not surrounded by arable land, then you could sell it outright. Um, otherwise, you were prevented from doing so, and the reason is because the land is conceived as a gift. As Leviticus says, the land, God says in Leviticus, the land is mine. Okay? Um, it is an inalienable gift of God given on condition in trust to a family through the generations. And the conditions are fulfilling the covenant obligations. So I said earlier, land is something like kinfolk. It's like family. Uh, likewise, land is what, or related to that, land is what makes literal family life possible. So it does not belong to me as an individual. It belongs to me as a member of a family from generation to generation. Contrast that with the real estate um, mentality with which that is pervasive in our society. Certainly, it was mother's milk to me. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, actually, that's not quite true. It became a way of thinking in my, I would say, late teen, early adult years. When we were children, we assumed we would live where our parents have lived, as I said yesterday, to, to be a Californian and to have left, as I have, means to know that you can never go back to where you grew up from. You can't trade a house in Durham, North Carolina for a house in, in Belvedere, California, okay? So, um, but contrast that real estate mentality with um, the biblical view that the land is invaluable, and then I'll give you, a, a, I think, the next slide. Uh, yes, this is um, Wendell Berry's um, observation. He's talking about uh, uh, the basic agrarian principle of <clears throat> or view of land, and he says this. Agrarians value land because somewhere back in the history of their consciousness is the memory of being landless. If you have no land, you have nothing. No food, no shelter, no warmth, no freedom, no life. If we remember this, we know that all economies begin to lie as soon as they assign a fixed value to land. People who have been landless know that the land is invaluable. It is worth everything. Whatever the market may say, the worth of the land is what it always was. It is worth what food, clothing, shelter, and freedom are worth. It is worth what life is worth. Of course, Israel is honest about how this principle of the invaluable character of land, how that principle was regularly violated on the ground. Israelites did become homeless. We know it repeatedly because in each, I mean, we know that it was the case because repeatedly in all of the legal codes of the Bible, in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, um, we have legal provision for what to do with the land, for the landless, how to restore landless families to the land. Obviously, it was a problem that Israel never managed to lick 
through the centuries, and so we have it in the oldest biblical code in the Bible, probably comes from the 10th century. We have it in Deuteronomy, probably from the 7th century. We have it in Leviticus, probably from the 6th century. So the problem of Israelites become landless was perennial. It happened not because they sold land voluntarily, which they evidently did not, but because the land was appropriated from them by the crown. Um, royal, um, the king controlling uh, the agricultural system, or by the aristocracy. The, la the king often paid off his military and political debts in land. Um, and taxes were exceedingly high in the ancient world, and certainly once Israel acquired a king, it also acquired a standing army. It also acquired pub great public works, um, which required both contributions, involuntary contributions of labor, um, and also people, it wasn't a monetary economy, it was a commodity-based based economy, but increasingly the great crops of the hill country, the grain, the wine, and the oil, they were channeled into the royal treasure houses. Um, so, starting in the ninth century then, there is, if the kings begin, um, if the first king Saul and David begin in the 10th century, by the ninth century, there's good biblical evidence uh, in the stories of Elijah and Elisha of a massive change in the food system that is in some ways analogous to the change that happened in the second half of the 20th century on our own continent um, with local or regional food security in increasingly yielding to a centralized economy managed from the top. So in Israel, small independent farmers who were engaged in regional trade, um, now they are paying their taxes um, into the royal coffers, um, bringing profit to the king, supporting his international trade, his um, military um, government complex, uh, supporting his diplomacy. The uh, kings in the ancient world carried out their dip diplomacy through feasting. Okay, you invited people to the palace to eat, okay? Um, and we have accounts of Solomon's table in the Book of Kings, and it would be clear that he was um, impoverishing the countryside uh, in order to equip his table and to equip the standing army, as I've mentioned. Interestingly, it is in this period with this massive shift in the economy this seems to be the thing that brings the prophets, the prophetic voice, to center stage in Israel. So the first stories of, prophet, of prophets, Elijah and Elisha, um, a lot of those stories have to do with eating. Um, and, um, and then in the following century, the eighth century, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, Micah, the first, we call them writing prophets, the prophets whose specific words seem to have been written down by, people, by their disciples. Um, I call these four, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, Micah, I call them the agrarian prophets because all of them are keenly attuned to the situation of small farmers, to people, the ordinary people, the 95, 98% who are sinking in the new royal economy, losing their land to the tiny, tiny aristocratic class. So just one instance of this, if I could have the next slide, um, is Isaiah chapter 5. Woe to you 
who add house to house. He, he's talking to the aristocrats engaged in what <clears throat> the Romans, <clears throat> who had the same problem, called latifundialization. Latifundialization means uh, wide estates. Okay? Um, and this is what's being described here. Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field until no space is left and you live alone in the land. The Lord Almighty has declared in my hearing, surely the great houses will become desolate and the fine mansions left without occupation. So this is basically um, small subsistence level agriculture yielding to great estates, plantations in the part of the world where I live, um, where often farmers who could no, not pay their taxes had to forfeit their land, ultimately had to forfeit their own freedom of uh, working the land that is now controlled by somebody else. Um, so they no longer control the um, distribution of the produce of the land. One unforgettable story of that is the story of Naboth's vineyard in 1 Kings 21. We can talk about that later if you want. All right, <clears throat> a third princ uh, principle um, is, um, oh, sorry, is what I call the principle of humble materiality. Humble materiality. Um, in my book on agriculture, I think this, I use this phrase in my chapter on Leviticus. And here I want to distinguish materiality, uh, which is, I think, part of the, um, it's the, part of the character of the Old Testament. It's what makes it so valuable to us. You can't be very abstract for very long about your faith when you're reading the Old Testament. I want to contrast materiality in that sense from materialism in the sense that we have perfected materialism in our own consumerist culture. Um, but Materiality um, means recognizing that a healthy materiality means recognizing that our spiritual lives cannot be separated legitimately from our material and economic lives. In other words, religious commitment that does not exert on us pressure about how we use material things. Religious commitment that doesn't exert that kind of pressure on us is a hollow commitment. It's a scam. Um, one place where the Bible suggests this is the 11th chapter of Genesis, the story of the Tower of Babel where the people on the plain of Shinar, as it's called in that story, Shinar is central Mesopotamia, the great empire to the east, the great agricultural empire uh, toward which modern Israel faces west. Um, ideologically speaking, culturally speaking, modern Israel faces west, ancient Israel faced east. Okay. It faced east toward the great culture in its time of Mesopotamia. So the 11th chapter of Genesis speaks of the people on the plain of Shinar uh, building a tower with its head in the sky. And you remember they say, let's make a name for ourselves so we, we won't be scattered over the face of the earth. Interesting. Let's make a name for ourselves so we won't be scattered over the face of the earth. Uh, Mesopotamians were city dwellers. Israelites were scattered over the face of the earth. They were farmers who lived in small villages, usually 50, 75, 100 people. Uh, but this is what they see when they're looking east. Um, and they make a kind of caricature in chapter 11 of Genesis of what they see with these um, 
Babylonians, okay? Um, they see ci city builders all clumped together, resisting dispersion with their inflated imaginations in the clouds. Let's build a tower with its head in the sky. Um, so they are sort of roasting the technologically dominant culture of their age. Um, the Mesopotamians had created a hugely prosperous agricultural empire by aggressively channeling the Tigris and the Euphrates to create fields where there used to be desert. This was, again, I'm a Californian, this was the central valley of the ancient world. And they built these great cities, which were only possible because they had built this huge agricultural base. Okay. Um, they, and each of the cities had a temple tower. They called them, as you know, from fourth grade ziggurats. Okay. Um, the ziggurat dominated the otherwise flat skyline of Mesopotamia. This is the tower with its head in the sky that the Israelites are talking about. But over the centuries, irrigation exacted its environmental price in Mesopotamia in the form of a rising water table, salinization of the soil, erosion, and silting. And so if you look at maps through the millennia in Mesopotamia, you see the, the centers of civilization, the big capital cities, gradually moving upstream as the plain becomes too salinized to um, the first thing it can't grow is wheat. Can, people continue to grow barley because barley can take a higher saline level. But as that becomes impossible, if you look at the next slide, I think we'll see what those fields look like today. Um, and so salinization is permanent destruction. Um, and I think this, this progressive abandonment um, of the downstream plain um, with its cities, I think this is what Bab uh, the Bible has in mind when it speaks of God coming down and scattering the Babylonians, they had to abandon their proud city with its head in the sky. The psalmist has a verse to, that speaks to that head in the sky mindset that is mocked in Genesis 11. Uh, I think I've got a slide of it. It's this verse. The heavens are heavens for the Lord, but the earth he gave to human beings. The folly of the Babylonian tower builders is that they took their eyes off the ground. They took their eyes off what God had entrusted to them, the earth. They forgot the humus from which they were made, Adam from Adama, the humus on which human lives depend the fragile, fertile soil that God had given into their care. And thus, the Babylonians lost their humility, their healthy, soil-based materiality. A danger, I would say, um, that threatens us acutely in our society. Thank you. Um,